a moment, you are going to hear the voice of a man who will tell you some tremendously important facts. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Today, I have a very special episode. Somebody I've wanted to talk to for a very long time. The one and only Neil Donald Walsh. Neil is the author of 37 books combining modern day psychology and practical spirituality. His titles have sold in the millions and have been translated into 35 languages, but more importantly, they have touched mine and many other souls in expanding our understanding of ourselves and of God. And Neil showed a great courage in listening and dictating and talking about these words. And thank you so much for your contribution and welcome to the Reality Revolution, Neil. Thank you, Brian. Those are very kind words to have said about me, and I wish I could live up to them in reality, but I do appreciate that. And I understand that what um, was given to me, I simply took dictation, as you pointed out, but I do understand that was what was given to me to share has apparently touched other people, yourself included, in a very positive and beneficial way. So I appreciate your sharing that with me. It feels good to know that. You know, we all want to think that what we're doing is bringing some benefit to the lives of others. So thank you for saying that to me. How can I serve you today? Thank you so much for that question. And and it's the same question I have for you. So we both have a, a similar goal. And how can we serve each other? I was particularly delighted in your most recent book, The uh, Essential Path. And you ask a powerful question. Anybody that's followed Neil's uh, writings and teachings, Conversations with God is an amazing treatise in which Neil talks to God in a powerful and unique way. And through over time, we've seen an expansion of these ideas of what God is and how we communicate with him. And in your most recent book, The Essential Path, you ask an important question, looking at what's going on with humanity now and our biggest problems, the division that we've created in the world, our seeming movement towards separation from the oneness. And it was a powerful book that really inspired me to move back towards a greater understanding of the oneness of who I am in connection with God. I would like to ask how, you know, as you've gone along your spiritual path, what inspired you to write that particular book? What was the question that you were wanting to answer? I think it's the question that everyone is asking these days, which is, why are we, meaning the human race, why are we human beings acting the way we are? Why, why, uh, what's going on in, on our planet these days? And we've just gone through uh, several years of, of very difficult challenges, maybe more difficult, uh, cumulatively speaking, than any uh, 24 month period I can recall in my lifetime where things just seem to pile on, one thing after the other. And uh, you know the, the terrible economic challenges that have been created by the COVID thing, uh, the Ukraine experience, and many other, we don't need to go through a shopping list, but we can certainly see that, that our pathway here has become dysfunctional. That is, human behaviors have become self-defeating, right and left. And so I guess I, one day I woke up and I was reading the headlines on the on the internet, you know, like I do, I'm kind of addicted. I'm a newsophile, so I'm opening my my um, my news applications. I, I I follow CNN and NBC News and Fox News and all the news channels. And I, one morning, uh, Brian, I was reading the, the headlines, and I thought, there's got to be something missing here in the way human beings are understanding life. There's there's we're acting as if there's some data missing. We're acting as if we're trying to play a game of chess, but no one's told us the rules. So, so I mean, and what's sad is that we have been given the, the so-called rules. That is, we've been given the guidelines on how we can best interact with each other. We're simply ignoring them or forgetting them or not fully understanding them. One of the three. So and, and the little voice inside of my head said, well, Neil, then write a book and explain what's essential for us to understand and to hear and to and to and to express and to stop rejecting and stop forgetting just you know, you know neil you're a writer you know, do do that so i sat down one day 
you know what, Brian, I wrote that book in about, as I recall, 12 days, 12 or 14 days, less than two weeks. I wrote that. It just just moved right through me very quickly. And before I knew it, I had a full-length book. And I thought, I better stop, I better stop here or I could go on and write an encyclopedia. So I stopped and I sent it off to my literary agent who said I, I might be able to find a publisher for this. And they did. And the book uh, was published. So that's really what caused me to do it is I thought, okay, and the central question of humanity right now, I believe, Brian, is this. It's a simple question. Is it possible, just possible, that there's something we don't fully understand here about life, about the thing that many people call God, and for that matter, about ourselves, the understanding of which would change everything? So that's the question that I put before humanity. Is it possible? Just possible. And you know what? It's not an, an idle question, Brian, that there's something you don't fully understand because there are many people, not a few, millions of people who say, no, 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 Neil, we understand. It's all there in the book. It's right there in the book. Just read the book. So then I have to ask them, well, which book would you have me read? Oh, of course, the Bhagavad Gita. What's the matter with you? No, it's the Talmud. What's the matter with you? No, 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 it's the Book of Mormon. No, what's, the, what's the, Neil, it's in the book. Oh, of, of course, the Upanishads. Oh, no, no, no. so there are 426 sacred scriptures in the world today. Which book would you have me read? And of course, the people who, who are reading a particular book are saying, this is the one. No, 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 this is the one. No, this is the one. So we're kind of stuck not knowing, you know, what it is because the books differ between them with regard to what the essential path is. Some books even tell us that how you dress is part of the essential path. If you're a female, you must have certain parts of your body completely covered or you must wear a particular headdress or you must dress in a certain way. Or, you know, and years ago when I was a child, if you were a Catholic, there were certain kinds of food you couldn't eat on a certain day of the week. I actually lived in a home where we couldn't have meat on Fridays. So, I mean, and, and I was told it was a sin. The Catholic Church said no, no, no eating meat on Fridays. Thursdays is okay, Saturdays is okay, but Fridays not. Now, my nine year old mind is trying to figure this out. God is really that upset about you eating meat on Friday? Or trying to figure this out, God's really that upset if you don't wear a certain headdress, a certain don't, don't or don't cover your body from head to toe if you're a female. Much less are you not allowed to go to university, or even walk through the park because you're the wrong gender. What is it that causes us to think that God has these preferences, and not even preferences, but if you please, demands that God has these demands, and that if we don't meet these demands of this. God, that she will judge. Oh my God, I don't believe I said she. I'm going to hell. <laughs> that, 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 that he will judge us, condemn us, and punish us for. So I thought, okay, there's something not just laughable, but almost ridiculous about some of the things that we believe that if there is a God even, that God wants, requires, and demands. So I wrote The Essential Path just to offer my ideas about it and place them into the mar marketplace of thoughts that we could share with each other. And that's the answer to your question. That's my 14-minute answer to your 30-second question. The, the essential part of this decision that I find, and I'm like you, I'm a newsophile, and I'm watching and reading, you know, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New York Times. I want, I want it all. I want all the information I see. The trend I see in particular, and I wanted to get your view of this, within the question of oneness is a decision or choice about the self. I see a, a somebody saying, I'm going to only choose to support myself only. And I'm going to do things only for myself. I'm going to get money for myself. I'm going to manipulate those people for myself. And then there's the person that says, I, I want to help other people because they're myself. I become one with them. And then myself sort of goes away. And there's an, this boundary between me and you. 
goes away and I see myself in you and it's a definition of self and it's a conflict. I see the serving people that are serving the self and the people that are wanting to serve others. As you opened up and asked me, how can I serve you? The people serving self are saying, how can I serve myself today? And I see, and, and so there's a conflict between these two, these two uh, mindsets and they're both God. And it's almost like we're watching uh, the people's understanding of God within this, this decision or mindset. I'd love to get your thoughts on this interplay between self and other self within the oneness. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Of course, to me, at least, um, I, I think that you've touched on the largest problem, largest challenge facing our species. Mm -hmm which is our identity. We, we have not really decided, I mean, collectively decided, we have not reached a consensus among the human species with regard to who we are. There's, there, there's, a, there's only one central question, really, as I see it in life, is that's who am I? You know, who, who am I? And um, so am I simply a physical entity? Not much different from a bird in the sky or a fish in the sea. You know, I'm born, I live, I die, and that's the beginning and the end of it. Maybe I'm more sophisticated than those other spiritual entities, but you know, basically I'm a, I'm sorry, I meant to say than those other uh, yeah, physical entities, but 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 um maybe that's just who I am. I'm a physical being. Or is it possible that I'm more than a physical entity, more than a, you know. Maybe I'm a spiritual entity. Now, if I'm a spiritual entity, now what's amazing is that so many of the believers in those 400 and some odd religions believe that they are spiritual entities. That is, they, that is, they believe in the existence of what we're going to loosely call spirit or the soul, the human soul. But but they don't understand who, who the soul is. They think that the soul is separate from that which is holy, divine, and blessed. That somehow, because we, we have bought into, uh, Brian, we, we, we bought into the traditional story that many of the world's belief systems have embraced, which is the story of that God threw us out of the Garden of Eden. That we were, and you know, in the, in the Korean culture, it's called, the, 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 they talk about the same story. But, you know, the, the, they talk about you know, the supreme being throwing all of the entities out of the garden, right? and because and so until we learn how to get along, so we have bought theologically into the notion of separation that we are even if we're spiritual beings that we're somehow separate from the source of it, and so that and we're trying to and, and the, the story that. Most of the world's religions teach us is that we have been separated from the source of our creation and we're fighting to get back, trying to figure out how to get back. We're struggling to get back. We're trying to do whatever is right in order for us to get back home because we all want to go to heaven. We don't. Nobody wants to die and go to hell and as if there is a place like hell. So we're all trying to avoid the worst possible outcome. And so the challenge before humanity is have we got it right? Are we accurate in our understanding that we are spiritual entities for sure, but that we are separate from the source that created us? And not only that we're separate from the source, but that the source has separated us from him out of dissatisfaction, out of anger, you know, that, that we weren't somehow living up to you know, as if God could create a mess and then say, and then blame us for it. You know, you know okay, well, okay, I, I guess I didn't make these creations as wonderful as they could have been, but it's their fault. Because look, they're not even obeying what I'm telling them to do. They're actually walking around. Women are actually walking around on the earth, allowing people to see their hair without covering it up. Oh my God. W w w women are actually imagining that they, that they should go to a university and learn stuff. Don't they understand that people with vaginas are not supposed to know anything? They're not even allowed to go to secondary school. You're lucky we allow them to go to grade school, but we have to at least teach them how to speak and how to use, you know, simple math. 
Otherwise, how can they handle the household budget? So, you know, we have these incredible stories that we've told, uh, told ourselves about ourselves and who we are. So my friend Brian, the solution to all this as I've come to understand it, as the God of my understanding has made it clear to me, is for us to reclaim our actual identity. And God has said, you know, think of me as kind of like a stem cell. You know, uh, uh, we've all heard about stem cells in the past 25 or 30 years, undifferentiated cells that exist inside of every embryonic uh, being, Re really every living entity starts with an undifferentiated stem cell. And then the stem cell differentiates and becomes the cell of our lungs or our heart or our brain or, or whatever it might be in terms of what is coming into being as a living entity. Well, God says, think of me as a stem cell of the universe. And I have, I'm the undifferentiated energy that has differentiated as you. That there's no separation between you and me. There's simply individuation. But individuation and separation are not the same thing. And so the mistake that human beings have made is that we think that individuation and separation are the same thing. What would change in human behavior if we thought for one minute that there was no separation simply because there was individuation, that God and we are one, and that our opportunity in this physical life is to claim, to express, to demonstrate, and to experience our oneness with the divine. Oh, gosh, Brian. Nothing would make God happier than for us to come home. And we were taught in the Bible of the story of the prodigal son. But we think that the prodigal son doesn't apply to us. No, no, it's not us. No, no, no. We're, we're, we're. So, but in fact, the greatest desire of life is to experience and express itself as a unified, single, energetic projection. And you know what's ironic about that? When we do behave that way, and all of us have had moments of when we have, I've never met a person who has not who can't think of a time or two, maybe more than two or three, many times when they've risen to the occasion, become, if you please, larger than themselves, in their generosity, in their understanding, in their patience, in their compassion, in their forgiveness, have become larger versions of themselves and gone to bed that night with their head on the pillow, thinking to themselves, now that's who I am. That's who I choose to be. Why can't I just be more of that, more of the time? Because we've been told that to even think that we and God are one, that we are expressions of divinity, that even to think that, much less announce it out loud, is blasphemy. That God will send us to hell even for that, for just declaring that. So, wow. Okay, so of course if all those things are true, in fact, I am really going to hell. I mean, I'm the guy who wrote a book called Conversations with God. You can't even imagine how many letters, by the way, and emails <laughs> and communications I've gotten from people saying, how dare you? How dare you claim to have had a conversation with God? Because we agree that God, that we can talk to God, you know, it's called prayer. We all have the ability to pray. But God doesn't talk directly to what well, maybe, maybe to the Pope. But other than the Pope, God doesn't talk directly to Maybe to the Archbishop of Canterbury, but if it, but God doesn't talk directly. To, well, maybe to the Chief Rabbi, but, or, or maybe to the pre, or maybe to everybody. Maybe God talks to everybody. Maybe we call that inspiration. Absolutely, uh, it's you know you encountered the same opposition that Jesus did. Jesus is saying. Does not your Bible say ye are gods? Jesus is making the argument against separation. And it was all, in my own opinion, it was all misunderstood. Of and course. so uh, those who have encountered this oneness that you advocate for so beautifully in your book 
have always seemed to face this opposition. Uh, when I go into deep meditation sometimes, and I would love to talk about this with you, I, I sometimes go all the way back to the beginning and it, every the universe feels like a single breath in and out. And we've done this before multiple times. Uh, this is not the first time that it feels like we've been in this universe and it feels like we've, we've come together as one and we've exploded out into a, millions of beautiful in, in, in differentiations. And then we've come back as one, like a breath, like I could, I, I, I could feel this, this desire for extension and branching out and learning and, and individualization is a, a beautiful example of God becoming more of God at the same time, a desire to come back. And, and it's, it's it, this whole process of identifying myself within it, but also understanding the reason for this individuation is beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. I can sit within it and I want to see the universe individualize more and more because that's what God wants me and us to do. Um, and, and there's this, this point where we can understand that that, that, that the whole system is set up so beautifully so that over time, everybody will individualize more and more into I, I'm al almost wordless. I, I don't have the beautiful wording that you do, but do you understand what I'm trying to get at? <laughs> no, I have the foggiest notion what you're talking about. You, <laughs> you, you must be a crazy man. I don't even know how I could have agreed to be on this interview. You, you're obviously, <laughs> you're a blasphemous person who has no spiritual morals. I will repent. <laughs> or go to hell, one or the other. Right. But I want to clarify the reason for the individuation. There could easily be a point where if you're all powerful like God and you have all things, why not just sit in that perfect bliss and do nothing, right? There could be that point. But there's a reason why the universe is thrown out into billions and trillions of different variations, constantly individualizing itself on and I on can, and I on. can answer the question, you know, uh, why if, you're, if, you're, if you are all these things that divinity is? Why not just sit in that knowing? Mm -hmm. Because knowing is not enough. It's not enough. We want to express it. We want to experience it. Let me explain to you when I first realized that. I was around maybe 13, perhaps 14. I don't know, maybe I was 15, but somewhere between 14 and 15, I came to my first realization that knowing about something and experiencing it were two entirely different things. It's when I was handed my first copy of Playboy magazine. <laughs> and I remember seeing the, the, you know, the, 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 the centerfold of this naked lady. And she was entirely naked. There was nothing hidden. I saw the whole thing. And I thought, you know, I don't want to just know about that. I want to experience it. And that uh, produced uh, an energetic within me. Ultimately, uh, later on in my life, that generated nine children, including triplets. <laughs> so, so what I noticed is that um, the soul of the creations of divinity seek to experience, not just to know about. They want to experience divinity and all the aspects of divinity for the purpose of evolving into the next grandest expression of it, because life seeks to expand and to expand and to expand. And so in that impulse of life to become the next greatest version of itself, we find ourselves yearning to know what does it feel like to be sexual, to be compassionate, to be forgiving, to be understanding. What does it feel like to be divine? What, is it, what does it feel like? And, and I want to express and experience that at the next level, not just at an elementary level, but I want to know more and more and more about that. And I want to demonstrate more and more about that. That is the impulse that has driven every person who we have called saintly or holy on this planet. And there have been many, not just one. There have been many who have felt that impulse and who have met that desire and placed it into action and become walking examples of what it means to be divine.
you know, I, I met such a person in my life. His name was Thich Nhat Hanh. He was a Buddhist monk. We, uh, we, we co-presented. Uh, we didn't present on the same program, but we were in the same slate of presenters at a, at a spiritual event uh, a number of years ago. But of course, I met him because we were in the reception area for all the speakers. I got to tell you that when Thich Nhat Hanh walked into the room, believe me that the energy and the vibration in that room shifted as soon as he walked into the room because he brought with him an energetic that affected everyone who was in his presence. He was an extraordinary individual, an individual of unlimited kindness, understanding, clarity, compassion, awareness, yes, forgiveness. You. And perhaps most of us have met at least one or two people like that in our life. Some of us could claim our own parents. My mother was like that, or whoever we, we might say, yes, I've known that like a walking saint. Most of us have known people who have either uh, achieved that level or have certainly moved deeply in that process toward achieving that level of spiritual mastery. And that's the impulse. Growth is the fundamental instinct of every living thing, from human beings to the universe itself. Everything seeks to become a larger version of itself in the next possible moment. It's, and it's as you quite point out, the breathing in and the breathing out of God itself. It's truly amazing and remarkable. And you put you put it in in words to help me reflect and 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 be in that place. And that, that's what's so powerful about what you do. So I, I would love to get your impression of the way that people understand God oftentimes is how they are in their own lives. If they if they're if they look at God as an angry God, oftentimes when I get to talking to that person, they're very angry. If they look if they if they look at God as a as a friendly and good God, they seem to be very friendly. Oftentimes people's understanding of God really is not about God themselves, but more about and what's going on within them. They haven't really gone to that place of trying to understand what God is yet, which is what we're always doing. But it's more well, it's of a, a question of what it's a question of which came first, the chicken or the egg. Right. See, what comes first? Our attitude about life and then our thought about God, or our thought about God and then our attitude about life. See, yeah. which which came first? The chicken or the egg? And I have to I suggest that there's no one size fits all answer to that question. Some people who you know, grew up in a difficult, challenging, if not to say abusive household, might become you know, at the age of four, six, eight, 10, 12, 15, 18, by the time they're 25 years old, they're angry individuals. And their idea about God might be that God is an angry God, because you know, one thing leads to another. And on the other hand, people who grew up in a different kind of household that was incredibly loving, caring, forgiving, compassionate, rewarding, and generous, emotionally generous a space might uh, feel wonderful about life and about who they are. And therefore, but maybe it's because they lived in a home in which the highest power was described in the same way and demonstrated in that household. So I'm not sure there's a one-size-fits-all answer uh, to the inquiry that you make here. But I do think that there is a direct relationship. I would, I would agree with that. I think there's a relationship between how we see life and how we see God. There's no, no question about, about that in my mind. And it's been um, observed by me that people who do hold God as a caring, loving, unconditionally loving, generous, kind, forgiving, blessed, compassionate, energetic, tend to demonstrate that in their own life. And you know when they don't? You know what's interesting? When they don't, when they hold God in that way, but act in this way, we think, what? I'm sorry, well, I, I, thought you, I thought you believed in this, but you're acting in this way. 
there are certain people who belong to certain religions, you know, I won't name any particular one, but who believe in those religious doctrines so deeply that they believe they believe in the doctrine of love so ferociously that they attack others who don't accept their own beliefs. They literally attack others verbally and in some cases physically because those others are not sharing and embracing their beliefs about a loving, caring, compassionate God. More people have been killed on this planet in the name of God than for any other individual or specific reason. The crusades that were undertaken by the Roman Catholic Church for several hundred years are a prime example of this, as well as the movement of certain members of the Islamic faith through countries that, where, where they were vicious toward those who didn't immediately embrace their particular point of view. It's, 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 so we, we've been killing people in the name of God for a very long time. And we're doing it right now today. This isn't just ancient behavior. It's happening right now. People are being, if not killed, certainly imprisoned and thrown in jail. Thrown in jail mm -hmm. for not wearing something over their head and allowing people to see their natural hair. Now, that's not a problem for you because you can let people see your natural hair <laughs> because you don't have any. Exactly. But if, if on your head, but, but, or you have very little. But, you know, we, we can joke about it, but it's no joke yeah. when we realize that there are actual human beings who are thrown into prison, arrested by the so-called morality police, and thrown into prison because they've allowed their hair, their hair on their head to be seen by someone else in it's, public. It's a cognitive dissonance. And only if you're a female, by the way. If you're a male, right. it's no problem. Which is exactly the core of the problem is they cannot see the oneness in all. They see the female as separate. If well, they here's, the, here's the deal. The female here's the deal. as one, it would be different, right? Yeah, yeah, but here's the deal. See, people who hold that belief will explain to you and if they're kind, I'll at least try to be patient with you because I've had them patiently explain to me, Neil, it's about temptation. We realize that the hair and the general appearance of a woman, if she allows her body to be shown with a tight fitting outfit or whatever, it's a temptation. And we all know that men are animals and cannot control themselves. So our faith requires us to demand that women Stop being the temptress and, and discontinue any behaviors that would be a temptation to animalistic men. Because after all, it was Eve who created the, the downfall of humanity. But, I mean, Adam was standing there being perfectly okay, doing what God wanted. God said, don't eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And Adam said, okay, fine, I won't do it. But Eve, of course, said, I'm going to eat the apple because God said not to. So, so Eve is the problem, not Adam. And we've made Eve the problem throughout the rest of human history. That's why even in the United States, until very recent times, through half of my lifetime, I'm not talking about hundreds of years ago. I'm talking about in my lifetime. Yeah. We refused to pay women the same salary as we paid men to do precisely the same job. It's true. Because they didn't have a penis. And if you don't have a penis, you don't get to have the same salary. Yeah. What, what, what is that? And we can't even admit our own insane behaviors. Wow. Yeah. It, it It is astonishing. And I, I'll... You know, it makes me I want a, a a new favorite loving interpretation of the Bible is that Eve is just my subconscious, and they had, of course, they had to take my ribs to protect my heart, which represents the subconscious, and so Eve is always just a part of me, just the subconscious part of me that I communicate with as I go to sleep, and so a lot of times some of those old Bible stories might have been meant as symbolic in other ways, and of course they've been misinterpreted and utilized to um, terrible ends, that's for sure. <laughs> um, I communicate with Eve when I go to sleep as well. Exactly. Except that 
she's actually lying next to me <laughs> in in physical form. And the nature of my communication probably can't be repeated on this program. And that's a good thing. It's good um, for me. Yeah, I don't absolutely. Know if it's good for you. Like I always say to her, it was good for me. Was it good for you? <laughs> <laughs> so I I would love to know, and I'm sure you've had this question. I'm, lo I'm losing half my audience here. You should know. It's that. okay. It's okay. You haven't. I promise you're gaining your audience. It's a wonderful thing. I would love to go back to the very first times, and you kind of have talked about this, talk a little, bit, a little bit about it in your book, when you started to receive in the conversation with God, the, the, this wonderful text that started coming through you and the doubts, which you talk about in the book, the doubts you had, this could be just my imagination. I would like to know... Uh, just, I would like to go back to that time just as somebody that's watching a movie of it occurring and for you to tell me about this realization of what was happening from within, just to share that, just to share that knowing and that experience with you. Well, of course, as you know, they did make a movie of it, ironically. Yes. Um, Hollywood came, came to my knocking at my door and asked if, if they could make a movie of it. And it's fantastic. My experience, which, which I allowed them to do if they gave me script approval and made sure that uh, I had the final say on what was told in the, in the film. Right. So, but my experience was um, almost from the beginning, you know, I didn't even doubt uh, until I was relatively deep into the experience that what was happening is what was happening. That is, I, I thought I was actually having a, a conversation with God. But then somewhere into it, you know, maybe in, and when I say into it, I mean maybe in the fifth or sixth day as opposed to fifth or sixth year, but it's like you know, five or six days into it, I thought, gosh, you know, like you said, am I making this all up? And I asked God directly. I, by the way, this is all handwritten. I was not doing this on my computer. I was just, you know, um, Brian, it was a very personal process that 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 this began as mm -hmm. I was simply going through a very 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 challenging time in my life when everything was falling apart I did in fact at that moment in my life I lose my relationship with my significant other my marriage had broken down and we had agreed to end uh, that form of our relationship so I lost my marriage five days later I lost my job. I was downsized. My corporation felt that, you know, and they, they made it very clear to me. I said, you know, was I performing that badly? They said, no, it's just the opposite. We really loved your performance. You're one of our prized employees, but, you know, last in, first out, seniority, rules, and we have to lose some overhead, so we had to ask you to leave. So five days after losing my marriage, I lose my job. Now, wait a minute. The world wasn't done with me yet because four days after that, all within within nine days, I'm driving to another interview, trying to get another job. And some older gentleman, God bless him, 84, 85 year old guy, made a left turn in front of me when there's no way in the world he could have made it across that lane without smashing right into me. I don't know what he was thinking. And he acknowledged later that he didn't know what he was thinking either. The police indicated that it was clearly his fault. He acknowledged it was his fault. Everyone agreed it was his fault. But I had a, a almost total car. But worse yet, I suffered a broken neck because of the impact of that accident. And it wasn't a hairline fracture, Brian. I, had a, I recall the wording of the x-ray specifically to this day. I suffered a three-quarter inch avulsion fracture of the seven cervical vertebrae posteriorly. In other words, it was a fraction in my neck, fracture big enough to put a pencil through. Wow. They rushed me into surgery, of course. And the doctor, you know, told me after the procedure, man, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? I said, strange question. Why are you asking me? He said, because you shouldn't even here. People who suffer this kind of a fracture in this kind of critical location normally suffer, suffer spinal cord complications 
that often end their life or at the very least leave them paralyzed from the neck down. You've escaped both outcomes. I want you to go home and think about what you're going to do with the rest of your life. Because you're one in a thousand that escaped without that happening. So I went home, you know, I was living in a small apartment that I had just found, by the way, because my wife and I agreed to separate. I just got into this little place and I'm lying there thinking, why is this happening? What's I got the triple whammy here? The marriage, the job, and then my health. All three within 10 days. Well, okay, so what do you want from me? And that's what started me on this journey. Because I woke up one night at 4.30 in the morning, Brian, and I sat down in, in the couch in my little little place. And I, I, there was a coffee, there was a, a coffee table in front of me on which I found a yellow legal pad picked up the yellow legal pad and began writing a very angry letter to God. What does it take to make life work? What have I done to deserve a life of such continuing, endless struggle? And I remember writing that third question. I, I can recall to this day, I was, I was so angry. I was pressing down so hard. You could have read what I had written five pages deep. <laughs> That's the impression that the pen was making. And the third question was, what are the rules? Somebody tell me the damn rules. I'll play. I'll play the game called life. Just give me the rules. And after you give me the rules, don't change them every third day. That's when I began hearing answers to my questions. And I began writing down what I was hearing. And that went on for days on end. Every night at 4.26 in the morning, I'd wake up 4.23 before, before, between 4.15 and 4.30 in the morning, like clockwork, I would be awakened. And I'd continue that was that dialogue, having a very person, personal experience, never dreaming that anybody else, not even a close friend, much less people in Timbuktu, would be reading this dialogue. It didn't even occur to me. So, I, yeah. The, the experience I had was that I was having a direct communication with God. And then I went into doubt. Oh, okay, okay. Now on top of everything else, I'm losing my mind. <laughs> and then God said to me, you know, you are out of your mind. And it's about time. You need to get out of your mind and into your soul to understand who we are, what is true, who you are, and what your life is really about. So get out of your mind. Get the hell out of your mind. I mean, get the hell out of your mind. So I decided that I'm not making it all up. And you know, you, you know the answer. I'm sure you know the answer I got when I said, how do I know I'm not making it all up? I, you know, this is not just my imagination. And I'll never forget God's answer. Why would I not use any tool at my disposal, including your imagination? Where do you suppose Mozart came up with his music? Or you suppose Michelangelo came up with the incredible imageries he put on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel? Where does all creation come from if it doesn't come from your imagination? So allow yourself to know that I will use any tool at my disposal, including your imagination. Keep writing. Keep asking the questions. So I did. Question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. For weeks on end until I had many, many yellow legal pads full of handwritten questions and answers. And then I was told in that dialogue, you will make of this one day a book, and it will be accessed by many people. And Brian, you know what I thought? Yeah, sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send this to a publisher who's going to walk out to the workroom floor and say to his editors, hold the presses. Guy here is talking to God. It's not going to happen. It's ridiculous. It's not going to happen. Nobody's going to publish this. But I sent it to a publisher on a dare. I sent my, I'm talking my handwritten notes. I had them Xerox. I kept my original copy, but I had them Xerox. And I sent my handwritten notes to a publisher just to see what would happen. The rest, as they say, is not bragging, just saying. Publishing history. It wound up selling uh, two or three copies, or maybe two or three million. You know, I'll never forget the day that 
then somebody knocked on my door. There's a do doorbell rang in my house. I opened the door and it was a delivery guy from the local florist. He was bringing a big bouquet of flowers. I said, oh, gosh, I wonder who that's from. You know? So I just said, thank you very much. I brought it in. He said, oh, I have a little package here that goes with it. I said, well, thank you very much. I took the package, gave the guy a little tip for delivering it. He left the house. I op opened the package. It was a plaque, a brass plaque on a, on, a, on a wooden background. It said commemorating one million sales, conversations with God. You could have knocked me over with a feather. I wasn't actually tracking the sales. It didn't even occur to me. I thought maybe they might sell a few, few, a few thousand copies. It's kind of an interesting title. Fair enough. When I got that plaque, I thought, oh my God. Of course, the book wound up being translated into 37 languages and being sold around the world. So again, not bragging, just saying that somewhere along the way, I just allowed myself to embrace the truth that I held inside of my heart. I have had, and not only that, but the main message of conversation in the first 10 pages of the book, what became the book, in the first 10 pages of my handwritten dialogue, I said, well, then why me? God said, Neil, Neil, it's not you. I talk to everybody all the time. I talk to everybody, not Neil Donald Walsh exclusively. I talk to everybody all the time. The question is not to whom am I talking. The question is who's listening. You've listened. You've actually taken it down. And don't you dare not share this with others. These are the words of my beloved wife when I showed her the, the uh, back and forth dialogue of what became, I think, one of the later books in the series. I said to her, do I dare put this out there? She was talking about things. The, the book was called Home with God. It was talking about suicide and many other things. And my sweetheart looked at me and she said, you don't dare not put it out. I said, but people could become angry with me. They might even come to my house and do me no good, do me harm. God said, oh, so suddenly you're worried about yourself, are you? I looked at my darling and I said, now that's why I married you. It's in a, a phenomenal story and it teaches me so much in my own relationship with God. And I ref and and I, you're a reflection of me because I I I went through a similar situation where I I lost everything, and every moment it seems like it couldn't get any worse, and I should have died. Why is it that God speaks to us in those moments? Perhaps maybe I'm answering my own question, but perhaps that's when we're on. That's those are the times when we're listening, and the other times we're not. It seems like a lot of people have profound experiences when it seems like we've lost everything and in those moments are when the light comes in what is your what is your observation of why those moments can be so profound when it feels like we've lost everything um when we are closest to god well you've answered the question you have answered the question yourself it's not in those moments when the light comes in but it's in those moments when we see the light yeah and there's a difference the light is always coming in, but we are seeing the light in those kinds of moments. So the, the masters, spiritual masters, people who have moved into or at least have traveled the path toward spiritual mastery are people who have allowed themselves to express and experience that divinity is part of their experience, that they are hearing from divinity and that they are in fact not separate from divinity but that they are, in fact, demonstrations and individuations of divinity all the moments of their life, not just once in a while. If there was just a way we could inspire people to connect in that way without having to lose everything, if there was a way I could introduce and, and well, inspire... Not, 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 not all the people who have come to a place of inspiring others have done so because they've lost everything. I can name many, many people who have been huge inspirations to others who have not gone through that 
experience of huge loss. Byron Katie is just one, one example that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. She wrote this astonishing book, Loving What Is. And she didn't have to lose everything in order to love everything that she had. She just she saw it clearly into it. And we could name hundreds of other people as well. So I don't think that it's axiomatic. That, that only when we lose everything are we able to inspire others. There are many, many people who have inspired others, deeply inspired others, and some have done so, inter interestingly, ironically, some have inspired others massively precisely because they haven't lost everything, mm -hmm. but because they have failed to lose anything, and they become grander and grander versions of themselves. And the grander version of themselves that they become, the more they inspire others. So I'm going to reject the notion that the largest number of people have to be in a place of great loss. But I think that there are people like you and me, Brian, who are stubborn as an ox, stubborn as a mule. God said to me, hey, you know, don't blame me that I had to use a two by four and hit you over the head with a two by four in order for you to get it. Not every one of you of, of you have become inspiring to others have are two by four cases. Some of you have done it without me having to do that. But in, in our case, we've had to be you know, honked over the head with a two by four to wake us up because we were so deep asleep that we had to we had to be awakened. I had to God said to me, figuratively speaking, Neil, wake up. What would it take to wake you up? Because oh, I thought I see you thought it was about you. Oh, I get it. You thought it was because you're so brilliant. You're so good looking. You're so handsome. You're so nice. You're such a neat guy. You have such great ideas. You have such great many talents. You thought it was because of all of your talents. Oh, I see. You thought that I gave you those gifts to use for yourself. Ah. Well, how about we create a life where everything falls apart and, you, and all the gifts you have are pointless, worthless, and valueless. Now, where are you going to go from there? And that's what happened to Brian, poor Brian. <laughs> and that's what happened to Neil, poor Neil. But I, on my way out of that deep sleep, I like to think I woke up. Now my biggest challenge is to living into what I've been sharing. So the, the question and in, in the especially the, the American mind, it wants to do things. It wants to be given a set of techniques and things I can do. So it, it doesn't necessarily the your the inspirations you provide don't necessarily lend to that. But if you were to say, hey, from what I've experienced and learned, these are the things I do now that I apply activities, actions I take on a regular basis that connect me to that oneness, that inspire me and move me towards service. Is there any particular things you've learned along the way, techniques, actions I can take? Well, the biggest one, uh, the, the list could go on, and we don't have that kind of time, but I could give you one huge, huge one that changed everything for me. God said to me, Neil, whatever you want to experience in your own life, be the cause of another person experiencing it in theirs. So, and I, and then she showed me how I could apply that in so many areas of my life. If, if, you, if, you, if you want more abundance in your life, be the cause of someone else experiencing more abundance in theirs, which is why I can tell you I never walk by a homeless person on the street without having a fiver or a tenner in my pocket to put in their basket with, with a little cardboard sign, anything helps. If you want more humor in your life, be the cause of others having more humor in theirs. If you want more compassion in your life, be the cause of another experiencing more compassion in theirs. Whatever you want, give away. Because in the very act of giving it to another, you experience what? Oh, having this. I get it. I already had that. And I didn't realize it until I gave it away. You know, I want to give you a perfect example. This is a short one, but... You know, I was at a, at a time I didn't have tons of money. This is way before the books came out. But I did have a close friend of mine come to me. And I said, hey, what's up? He said, yeah, I'm in big trouble. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm going to lose my house. I said, what's up? He said, I, 
I gamble. I say, I can't. I don't dare tell my wife, but I gambled the money away, and I and I can't pay the mortgage. It's the third month in a row I've missed a mortgage. I said, Jesus, my God, what are you doing? He said, He said, Is there any way you could help me? He said, I promise on our friendship, we've known each other for twenty years. I will not stiff you on that. I will pay you back. I need. To, is there any way you could help? And I said, Man. What a time to ask me. I'm so I'm low on cash right now. But he said, Oh, damn, damn, damn. He said, Well, thanks. Thanks for giving it your thought. And he left. And as he was walking down the stairs in my third floor apartment, I thought, wait a minute, I, I, I got a couple of grand in the bank savings accounts. Not a lot of money, but I so I called him as he was over the balcony as he was walking to the car in the parking. I said, Come back back. He came back upstairs. He says, What's up? I said, You know what? How much do you need? And this this was 30 years, 25, 30 years ago, when the monthly mortgage payment was like $675. It wasn't like 3000 But, you know, he said, well, I need about $1,400, $1,500. I said, you got it. All right, let's go to the bank right now. I can. I've got, I think I got about two grand in savings. He said, really? I said, and I went and I gave him the money. You know what's funny? I, I told that story for a reason, Brian. I didn't miss it. Two months went by. I didn't, I, it was like, a, I didn't even miss it. I could have lived the next five years. He did pay it back. Not immediately, but it took him about eight months to pay it back. Little by little, 200 here, 200 there. But the point being that I didn't miss it. It was like, you know, all oh, my willingness to give away what I want someone else to have caused me to experience my own havingness of it. So I experienced my own abundance, my abundance of humor, my abundance of wisdom, thank you very much, my abundance of clarity, my abundance of money, my abundance of love, my abundance of whatever it is I want to experience more of over here, be the cause of someone else experiencing more of it over there. Now, you know what? What's ironic is I'm not the first person to suggest this. Some guy about, oh, roughly 2,000 years ago, put it this way. Do unto others as you would have it done unto you. It's pretty, very simple. So that's my single answer to your question. What is the tool? The biggest tool I would advise people to use if they want to change their life tomorrow is give away what you wish to receive. Then you will experience our oneness. I just want to thank you so much. You're glowing. You're pure love. It's such an honor to be in your presence, to share your words, to interact with you. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm. I, there's no words that I can say to you to thank you properly for what you've meant to me. And I know that I'm speaking for a lot of other people. And you're very humble. And I want you to accept what I'm saying. And please receive this incredible. Uh, gratitude that i feel through so many people so thank you so much for what you've done thank you for being uh, an example of what i can be thank you for showing me the path to walk on thank you for teaching me and i will continue as soon as i see your face anywhere on social media or anything i'm always watching i'm always learning keep doing what you're doing and welcome to the reality revolution mr walsh Thank you, Brian. Those are very kind things to say, and the check is in the mail. <laughs> Thank you. We return you now to your local announcement.